Um, well, can we pray together as I get ready to share? Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, it seems only appropriate that we just continue in the same spirit of worship, prayerfulness, and uh, we acknowledge right now that you are with us, Father, and that this time is very sacred. So please, Lord, speak to us. Let it be your voice that reaches into our hearts, and may we leave here knowing that we have been in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I don't have a PowerPoint today. And before I, um, well, let me put it this way. I chose my message this morning uh, before the tragic events of this week. And it seems like it's only highlighted uh, the, the moment when I uh, chose the topic of not home yet. I really chose that originally because it's Memorial Weekend. And when we think about the reasons of the holiday and the meaning of uh, remembering those who paid the ultimate sacrifice and service to our country, it reminds us that we're not home yet. With all due apologies and respect to Tim McGraw, we're not home yet. And when we think about the wars that are raging now in Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and elsewhere, we're reminded that we're not home yet. And God does not want us dwelling on the fear. He doesn't want us dwelling on uh, anger or frustration and, and, and living in, in uh, uh, an, an, un, an unacceptable manner because we long for something better. He gives us windows of blessing. We get to have a slice of heaven on earth, don't we, at times? At times, we get to experience great freedom and, and uh, euphoria and enjoyment, those little windows of, of perfection that comes into our life. But God instructs that we are to live this world as though we were pilgrims. We are to live in this world always understanding that there's a better final hope that God has in store for us. We're not home yet. And then we have... Just events, uh, as of, as has been mentioned. And thank you both, Chuck and Valeria, for sharing your thoughts and the beautiful message as well of of the just absolute and in, you know insanity of the loss of life that can happen in such uh, unreasonable ways. We're not home yet. A big portion and reason of why Jesus came to this earth originally was to help us understand that we're not home yet. And Toby, would I, could I get your help? I'm going to just one question this morning. I, I always like to talk with the young people, and so I have this tradition of having a, a kid's quiz. And so if you'll raise your hand, just one question, but there's different ways of answering it. What was Jesus known for when he was on the earth? What was he known for, for his actions and what he did? Just anything. Okay, I see London in the back here. And let's raise your hand so we can get it in the mic, so the streaming and everyone can hear it. And so, Toby, thank you. Um, miracles, healing people. Miracles, certainly, right? Wasn't Jesus, I mean, that's what he was known for, right? So thank you. Uh, Dylan, up here, you're going to get your exercise here, Toby. We've got this dichotomy. <laughs> Kylan, and so we'll come to Dylan first. What was Jesus known for? A preacher. A preacher. Very good. And then did we take them all, Kylan, or do you have one? The son of God. He was known for, yeah, for being the son of God. Sebastian, did you want to add something? Okay. Is it, don't, Am I missing anyone else? Oh, Isaiah. <laughs> Is that who you're pointing to, Mitch? He loves us. That he loves us. He, yes, wonderful. He was known for that message of love. Anyone else, maybe a specific a miracle or a specific? What were his teachings called? Let me ask that. What do we call his teachings? All right, Ketsia threw your hand right up. Scripture? Oh, I think you were going to say it and then you changed your mind. It, 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 he definitely used scripture, but there was a specific way of teaching. Ellie, right behind you, Toby. Parables? Parables. Parables. So he was known for these things. Thank you. That's, that's, that's what I'm going to Go ahead and draw. So thank you to our young people. I like to call it the three Ps. He was known for power, 
right? Power over the natural world, power over disease, power over demons, right? Miracles, works of wonder, right? He was known for power. He was known for parables or preaching. You can do whichever one you want, parables or preaching. And those who knew him best also knew him as a man of prayer. Prayer. Power, parables, and prayer. Those three things were elements that Jesus brought to us in our experience to let us know, yes, how much God loves us and let us know that we are not home yet. Um, when we think about the reminders that God gives us in our life to illustrate that we're not home yet, it seems like they're always emphasized to a greater extent in the lives of our children. Forgive me as I talk and walk here at the same time. I want you to pray for me this morning because I'm going to be sharing a rather personal area of our lives that God is blessed us with, but serves as another uh, reminder of there's something better that he wants to give us. Uh, if, if, if she's willing, Bailey, would you come up here, please? Yeah, I know. I feel the same way sometimes. <laughs> You guys were so gracious to us. You want to sit down, honey? Thank you. You guys were so gracious to our family this last week. We had, we had two graduations in our family. Toby graduated eighth grade, and then Bailey actually graduated from high school, even though, uh, you know, she's a little older, but when those have special needs, they can stay in the public school system a little bit longer. And, uh, we had a little party, and, and many of you, uh, experienced and expressed your love and appreciation for our family. Um, and that was a, a, a real blessing to us. Um, I want to share with you a little bit of our story and a little bit of our journey. I know, honey. If you want to go sit back down, you can. Or do you want to stay with me? <laughs> We're not home yet. <laughs> When I first came to this church, actually when I was first interviewing for the church, one of the things I mentioned on several occasions was, you know, our family has someone in the family that has special needs. And that's important to me that I'm part of a congregation that uh, is, is aware of that, is accommodating to that, and, and has an ability to appreciate the, the, the challenges and circumstances that having a child with special needs uh, is. And I was very impressed and very delighted with how the leadership here was willing to say that is not a problem. We are, we are happy to, to understand that experience. Um, and so I've been here almost two years now and not, I, I don't usually like to make the service about me or my family. We're here to worship the Lord. But I understand that sometimes our personal experiences enhances our ability to understand what God does in our life. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit uh, for just a few minutes with you about autism. And then I want to share a passage of Scripture that I think illustrates for our family a, a way in which God has um, given us some understanding and hope. So um, I, I realize that I can't tell a, a lifetime worth of information in this one moment. So just in a few minutes, uh, if you'll allow me, just a brief history of what autism is. Autism has actually been around for a hundred years. The, the word autism, it was first coined around the turn of the 20th century um, by Dr. Bluler, who used it to describe what we now know to be a psychiatric schizophrenia. But at that time, they had not developed a good mental health dictionary, and they were wrestling with how to identify these things. But he first used the word autism to describe someone who had kind of entered into themselves. That's auto, you know, from the Latin, um, uh, like autopilot, right? And, and really, it, it is a, a very, I think, appropriate description of what we think of as autism today. There's kind of like an internal conversation that Bailey has ongoing with herself at all times. And it doesn't always apply to reality. It's just almost a coping mechanism for her. She's always got a story going on. And that's why she has trouble sitting still or being quiet. It's just that story is just going on in her heart and her mind. Um, the Great Depression and the World Wars interrupted the science of mental health. 
So you see very little bit in the literature about schizophrenia or Down syndrome or autism for about 40 years until you get to about the mid-1940s um, when they began to expand the definition of autism. They began to see the OCD symptoms, the overly compulsive behaviors. Some people with autism uh, can insatiably wash their hands or things like that. Um, and they also noted the echolalia, the, the likelihood to just repeat what they hear, even though that repetition is not uh, making sense in the context. In the 1960s, um, they were still treating autism as a form of schizophrenia, uh, but they also noticed uh, there was a, a mistake made where in the 1960s and even into the 70s, instead of diagnosing the, di the autistic individual, they began diagnosing the mother. And it was called refrigerator mother syndrome. And that was in some of the official literature. For over a decade, they, the official scientific diagnosis was not that the child had autism, but that the mother had been cold. The mother had not nurtured the child. So it was the mother's fault for the child having these problems. That official language and diagnosis lasted even into the early 70s, which is it's interesting when I think of it like that. That seems very medieval to me. I mean, that doesn't seem like it would be appropriate even a generation ago, but yet these things still happen. Now, we know, obviously, that that's not true today. However, anecdotally, and the perception is, a lot of people with autistic children, the parents are still blamed. And the, bar and the parents also often are given the dirty looks. And the, why aren't you taking care of that child and their little, their things like that? So, but it was called for a, a while, refrigerator mother's syndrome. It wasn't until 1980 that autism was separated from schizophrenia. And it became, and this is the difference. Schizophrenia is a psychological or a psychiatric condition, whereas autism is a neurological condition. And there's a difference. This is not a psychiatric challenge. This is a neurological challenge. And it wasn't until 1980. It's, again, it, it's amazing how slow we are at times to recognize some of these things. In the mid-90s, autism was expanded to be called autism spectrum disorder. And it became an umbrella term, not just for your stereotypical autism, but now Asperger's, Rett's disorder, PDD-NOS, and a few other conditions now all fall within the spectrum of autism. It became known as ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder. And again, I'm jumping over a lot of things here, but just to be brief, today, um, in, the, in the 80s, autism was still diagnosed by three primary observational data points. Severe social communication challenges, um, a disinterest in people, and thirdly was repetitive OCD behaviors. Today, they've, re they've reduced that definition, and today, um, to be diagnosed with autism, you only need two observational data points. Instead of severe, it's now impaired social communication. Because now with Asperger's on the, um, on the spectrum, there are a lot of people with Asperger's, which is a mild, it's considered a mild form of autism. You would hardly even notice. Uh, she also has some etiquette and social politeness uh, dissociation. <laughs> but, um, uh, now it's just the two, impaired social communication and then reactive or repetitive behaviors. Okay, those are the two. There are no broadly accepted causes, treatments, therapies, or medication for autism. There's no broadly accepted. Even some that used to be accepted like applied behavioral therapy are now being challenged and shown to be not as effective as they hoped. Some of the drugs that they've come up, up with are also not showing to have the consistent um, ways of helping people with autism. The CDC, um, last I checked, the CDC says about 1 in 40 children today will be diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder of some kind, 1 in 40. However, advocacy groups and universities that study this will sometimes say it's much, much higher, as high as 1 in 20 some studies would suggest. So that's growing exponentially in, in addition to all the other potential um, uh, ways in which autism is growing in our society. Now, a few things about Bailey, if you'll allow me just a few minutes. Only about 20% of those with autism are girls. 
about one in five. It's much more rare in girls than it is in boys. And the type of autism in girls is also very unique. It often does not have some of the stereotypical behaviors and identifying marks uh, that you would think of with more severe cases. Bailey is considered moderate on the scale, not severe, not mild. And she's moderate for two reasons. One, she's verbal. She's verbal. She has the ability to use language and communication, and uh, we're very thankful for that. The second reason that she's moderate is that she has good emotional affect. Good emotional affect. And as you all know, emotional affect is the mental counterpart of interly bodily representations associated with emotions, actions that involve some degree of motivation, intensity, and force, or even personality dispositions. But you all know that. That's clear. No, emotional affect just means she is able to appropriately understand emotional situations. In a severe case of autism, you can tell someone your dog has died, and they won't be sad, they won't show any emotional, or you can tell them, today's your birthday. And in a severe case, there won't be any emotional affect. It won't affect them emotionally. They neither experience appropriate or adequate emotion based upon the context. Bailey has a very appropriate emotional affect. She's able to express her emotions uh, in, in, in a generally consistent manner with the, um, the stimuli. And again, we're very thankful for that. So that puts her kind of in the middle. Okay. Classic to Bailey... Uh, that she does lack certain social awareness and etiquette. She doesn't behave like a 20-year-old would in a, in a joint setting. She might pick her nose in front of you. <laughs> I know, I know. And there are other, other factors that are part of that um, social communication impairment. She does have echolalia and repetitive behaviors and movie quotes. Uh, she does seem to have an ongoing conversation in her mind that she can break out of at times but is uh, limited. As a matter of fact, we kind of kind of, sort of have a general rule we call the rule of three with Bailey. If ever you really want to have a conversation with her about something, you have to ask her three times. Because the first time that she hears, like if you were to ask her, Bailey, you know, have you had a good week? Her first response is usually whatever she says is, please leave me alone. I don't want to talk to you right now. She might not say that, she'll say something else, but that's really what she is indicating. The second time, and I'll give you an example of this, she's really kind of saying, if I just say this, will you leave me alone? The third time sometimes is when she will kind of recognize, okay, they're serious, I need to answer them. So an example of this, for many years in in another church, people would come to her and they would talk, try to talk to her and they say, Bailey, how are you? And she had this phrase that she would always use, I miss Gertie. Now, Gertie's our dog. Okay, so she'd say, I miss Gertie. And so people always perceived, and they would come to us and they say, wow, she really likes that. Every time I talk to her, she says, I miss Gertie. And we'd have to explain to her, that's just her way of saying, I don't want to talk to you. So you kind of had to say, hey, Bailey, how are you? I miss Gertie. Okay, but how are you? I really miss Gertie. All right, Bailey, but how are you? Oh, I'm fine. So it's kind of that rule of three. It doesn't always happen that way, but uh, usually by the third time, she's getting into the to, into the the mind and and uh, can help out. She ha- here's something two two very important things about certain uh, conditions of autism. She has no sense of time. To her, a past experience that was negative might as well have happened yesterday. It could have happened 10 years ago, but it's as fresh and real to her as it happened yesterday. And positive things as well. She'll remember a positive thing as if it happened yesterday, even though it happened a decade ago. And the same with the future. She can't anticipate future. To her, it's it's her birthday, uh, which is August 15th. She longs for it, waits for it, can't wait for it. And the very next day, or even by the end of the day, she's asking, what about Christmas? And then it's kind of a torturous experience as she waits for one positive thing after another. She is unable to anticipate or understand the passage of time. And and that's okay. We we understand that. But the the other thing that I think is helpful to understand with Bailey when it comes to autism is that she lives an incongruent reality. Okay? And what that means is this. She's 20 years old. Okay? She's 20. Her communication skills, her verbal, her verbal skills 
are about a 10 to 12 years old. She has the vocabulary and the ability to express herself at about what a 10 to 12 year old would do. Okay. Her cognition is about a first grader. Okay. She can do simple math, simple reading and writing about equivalent. She can work a doorknob. She can work a microwave. Uh, if Bambi were here, uh, she can work a cell phone. She called Bambi out of the blue a couple weeks ago. We didn't even know she had the ability to do that, but she called Bambi on her phone. She can work a cell phone. She can do problem solving at about a first grade level. Okay, Emotionally, she's a toddler. Okay, She still throws tantrums. She still will bang her head. She has the emotional controls and ability of about a toddler, which means how she looks, how she talks, how she thinks, and how she acts are in congruent. It's confusing to us, and it's confusing to her. She doesn't try to do that. She often recognizes that what I'm saying or what I'm doing or what I'm thinking are not congruent, and it frustrates her. And sometimes we are limited in our ability to anticipate or understand. Now, a lot of people with disabilities have one or two incongruencies. They might look able-bodied, but they have a a less able mind. Or they might look able-minded, but like cerebral palsy, they have a body that does not work with their mind. Or like Stephen Hawking and, you know, those. But with autism and other similar spectrum diseases, they suffer multiple incongruencies. Her life and her reality is incongruent. But we love her. If you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 9 is a story I want to draw your attention to. It's a familiar story to us, um, and I want to share it with you briefly and then uh, read a a statement or two from Desire of Ages. So in Mark chapter 9, to to sum up the story, the, the chapter begins with the transfiguration of Christ. He takes his three disciples, the favored disciples, and he goes up on a mountaintop and they get to witness an an extraordinary moment to see humanity meeting divinity and glorified in such a powerful way. Now, directly after that story and intentionally as Mark records it, you see this contrast for the, the height of glorification is then contrasted with the depths of human humiliation. So as Jesus comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he sees that there's a controversy that has developed with the remaining nine disciples and a situation that they were unable to bring resolution to. So we pick it up in verse 17. Jesus and the three disciples having just come down from the mountain, and they they see that there's been a problem. And it says in verse 17, and one of the crowd answered him and said, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with the spirit, which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and stiffens out. I told your disciples, these are the remaining nine, I told your disciples to cast it out, and they could not do it. Now, previous to this in Mark chapter 6, Jesus had given his disciples power to drive out spirits. And it specifically says in Mark chapter 6 that they had gone out and had great success. But on this occasion, for some reason, the nine disciples, the church, the followers of Christ were unable to address the needs of this father. At times, the church fails in its calling, doesn't it? At times, the church is unable to fulfill the glorious purpose that God wants for us to have. And that's not to be a slam on the church. That's just an an evidence that we are not perfect. And Jesus is, is looking at this situation and analyzing it. And the Father does what we should always do. Even when the church fails us, we can still go to Christ. Amen? And again, it's not to say that they weren't a growing body of believers and had lots to learn, but just in this one moment, only Christ could be the answer. 
And I know that for individuals like Bailey, we may have to wait until we can personally see Christ bring wholeness and resolution, although we don't cease praying for her continually. Do you understand what I mean by that? Secondly, I want to just make a quick comment. I do not believe that every neurological disorder is because of demon possession. And although there were times in the Bible that what appears to be epilepsy or uh, different forms of neurological disorders, Christ treats as direct demonic activity, I do not believe that every uh, psychological or neurological challenge is a direct assault of the devil, but I do believe that the devil uses this as an opportunity to bring challenges into our life. So I think it's possible to see that God is both directly and indirectly rebuking spirits that, that seek to bring destruction into our world, okay? So I could talk more about that, but I, I want to move on. So Jesus, in verse 19, he gives this kind of what sounds like an ex- exasperated statement, and there's, there's sometimes disagreement about who he's referring to, but I, for, for the sake of just uh, conversation, I think he's speaking both to the disciples and the apostles and the Pharisees uh, all together. It says, he answered them and said, oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. He was likely talking to the nine, but I think it was the, 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 the spirit of Jesus that was just emoting that he wishes things could be different. They brought the boy to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion, and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. By the way, have you ever seen someone actually grind their teeth? Have you actually ever seen someone grind their teeth? It is an extremely extremely unpleasant thing to witness. It typically happens under only two situations, extreme anger or extreme pain. Extreme anger or extreme pain. Now, notice too that it says that the father brought his son. We don't know how old he is because Jesus asks him, how long has this been happening? And he said, from childhood. He could have been 30 years old, the son. Okay, we sometimes picture him as a little tyke, right? Or, or maybe an adolescent. And we don't know, but all we know is that this individual had suffered under this condition from childhood. And Jesus said to him, oh, uh, he said he's often thrown him into the fire, into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw a crowd, he... uh, was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit and said, you deaf and mute spirit, I command you to come out of him and do not enter him again. Crying out and throwing him into a terrible convulsion, it came out and the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him and got him up. And when he came into the house, his disciples questioned and said privately, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Some of your Bibles say prayer and fasting. What Jesus was mentioning at this point is he's not talking about praying more for the person. He was actually rebuking the nine because the nine had allowed jealousy and frustration to come into their experience while Jesus was with the three on the mountaintop. And because they had allowed self and vanity and pride, it blocked the power of the Holy Spirit to affect the work that God wanted them to do in the life of the child, in the life of the family. And Jesus' statement was, your prayer connection with God was broken, therefore God was unable to work through you. And you need to restore that connection with the Lord if you want to see the Holy Spirit manifest these things in your life. Now, I could talk a a lot more about where and why and how these elements connect with our experience at some point with Bailey, but I want to just share um, in in, in closing just a couple of passages from Desire of Ages um, where she mentions this story. She says, Again, the prince of life and the prince of the powers of darkness had met on the field of battle. 
Christ in fulfillment of his mission to proclaim liberty to the captives, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and Satan seeking to hold his victim under his control. Angels of light and the hosts of evil angels unseen were pressing near to behold the conflict. Now here, notice this. For a moment, Jesus permitted the evil spirit to display his power. For a moment. How long's a moment? How long's a moment? Would you agree that some moments are longer than other moments? You know, it's interesting. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, for these momentary afflictions are developing in us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Paul was speaking about his own experience of affliction for these temporary momentary afflictions. For him, it was a lifetime that he calls a moment. In the book of James, he says that our life is but a vapor. In the, in the broad spectrum of eternity, could we say that even a lifetime could be considered a moment? For a moment, Jesus permitted the evil. It's been a long moment. It's a long moment. But some moments are longer than others. That the beholders might comprehend the deliverance that was to be wrought. Do you believe there's purpose in every life? Even though some moments last longer than others. She goes to say, there's no lack of power on the part of Christ. The healing of the Son, now this is hard, the healing of the Son depends upon the Father's faith. In other words, the Son was not in a condition to be able to perceive and pursue the deliverance that the Father knew they needed. Just like, the, just like the, the friends that had to bring the paralytic to Christ because the paralytic could not come on his own, his salvation, his healing depended upon the act of faith of the friends to bring him to Christ. Did you know in the Seventh-day Adventist church, there is no theology or methodology for allowing people with neurological disorders to become members of the church? We have two factors that are required to become a Seventh-day Adventist. Intellectual assent, you have to understand teaching, intellectual assent, and watery baptism. We make exceptions for watery baptism. In other words, if you're in prison or medically, you cannot be fully immersed, we will make an exception to that, and we will say, the Lord knows, and I'll sprinkle some water, but you, we, you just can't be. There is no exception within Seventh-day Adventist theology for when someone cannot make theological assent. I think that should change. Should Bailey or others be barred from church membership for their life because they have a mind of a child? Most churches are behind in these areas. It's not to be a slam on our churches. We typically are behind in dealing with social changes and things like that. By the way, Bailey is a member of this church. Our previous church was willing to vote her in by profession of faith. But I would like to see us as a denomination expand and broaden our investment and understanding of how we can include those with neurological disorders within the family, the official family of God. The healing of the son depends upon the father's faith. I wonder how much Bailey really does know. Do you think that children with, and those who've grown up with these disorders when they get to heaven, we'll look back and know what has happened? Do you think they will understand what their family tried to do for them? 
I believe that one day Bailey will be healed. And I just hope that she understands and appreciates what her family and her church family have done to bring her to faith. Lastly, again, I'm just jumping through a couple statements here. Speaking of this story, she says, it was an object lesson of redemption. The divine one from the Father's glory, stooping to save the lost. It represented also the disciples' mission. Now listen to this, please. Not alone upon the mountaintop with Jesus in hours of spiritual illumination is the life of Christ's servants to be spent. In other words, the Mount of Transfiguration is great. The moments of, you know, great connectivity and experiencing the beauty of the power of God is great. But our Christian experience cannot remain on that mountaintop. There is work for them down in the plain. Souls whom Satan is a slave are waiting for the word of faith and prayer to set them free. Jesus was known throughout his ministry as a healer. As someone who cared for the least. And some of them, and when you read the stories, suffered under their affliction for years, decades even, before they were able to see their full transformation. And I think every moment of that hurts the Lord's heart as much as it hurts ours. And I wish there was a solution. I wish that a prayer could simply remove these things. But I trust that God still has a plan. And should it be the day that Christ comes again in glory, that that's the day I can talk to her, I'm okay with that because I have an eternity to spend with her in heaven. And these momentary light afflictions are developing an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. But we're not home yet. We're not home yet. We still have work to do. We still have opportunity to reach the very least and preach the message of Jesus to both great and small. Thank you for letting me share about our daughter. Thank you for loving her. Thank you for your prayers. And thank you for letting Jesus work in your heart so that we could reach everyone until he comes. Shall we pray? Would you stand with me, honey? Would you stand with me? I want to go. That's why we're going to pray. I want to go, I said. Do you want to pray? No. Okay, well then, can I pray? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dear Lord, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that we can learn from our, our experiences and from our family. And I know, Lord, that others have similar stories. Others may have uh, different stories, but with the challenges of their own. And every story is precious and important. And within these, Lord, there are lessons that we can learn And there is windows where we see blessings and power and your glory. Thank you, Father, for the family that we have. And thank you, Lord, that we are waiting for that great and glorious day when there is no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death, no more graves. Lord, may that day come in your good timing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. You ready to go? All right, we're ready to go. (laughs) Thank you.